Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. It was a week in which the tumultuous landscape of the United States Republican Party took center stage with figures like Kevin McCarthy and the ever-persistent toxic presence of Donald Trump, who we learned may have blabbed about critical nuclear secrets to a billionaire he wanted to impress at Mar-a-Lago. While the dramas surrounding Trump and his supporters in Congress dominate headlines across the nation, they also captured the anxious attention of a global audience. In this tumultuous environment, our allies abroad find themselves on edge, and our adversaries see opportunities to assert themselves. The world community is keenly aware of the prospect of Trump's return to the presidency, with all the chaos and policy reversals that would entail. Even as Trump faces multiple legal challenges at home, his record and continuing presence pose challenges here and now for the Biden administration's foreign policy. Aside from the turbulent impact of Trump and his congressional allies, the Biden administration's foreign policy initiatives, while little noticed at home, have prompted a renewed engagement on multiple fronts and not simply with our traditional allies. To examine the administration's foreign policy record, with a particular focus on how the shockwaves from our own political system are reverberating around the globe and affecting the United States' position in the world order, I'm really pleased to welcome three of the country's most respected commentators and foreign policy authorities. And they are Natasha Bertrand, a CNN reporter now covering the Pentagon and national security. Natasha previously covered politics and national security for Business Insider, The Atlantic, NBC News, and Politico. In 2021, she was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list in media, and in 2023, part of a team that won an Emmy for CNN's coverage of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Haven't seen her for a while, so nice to have you back, Natasha Bertrand. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Robert Costa, the chief election and campaign correspondent for CBS News. He previously served as a national political reporter for The Washington Post, managing editor of PBS's Washington Week. In 2021, he co-authored the New York Times number one bestseller, Peril, with Bob Woodward, which we covered previously in our Talking Books series. Robert, thanks very much for returning to Talking Feds. Great to be back with you. And Amna Nawaz is an award-winning journalist, co-anchor of PBS NewsHour, and a contributor to NBC News and MSNBC. She previously anchored the breaking news coverage for ABC News and led the network's coverage of the 2016 election. Before that, she served as foreign correspondent and Islamabad bureau chief at NBC News. Thanks so much, Amna. Great to see you. Hi, good to be back with you. Let's start by discussing the ways in which Donald Trump, the once and possible future president, continues to cast a shadow on foreign policy and America's image abroad. So a blunt beginning. Trump, we've just learned, blab secrets, oh, about nuclear submarines, nuts and bolts, details like number of warheads when they become visible to someone at, at Mar-a-Lago who proceeded to tell them to a dozen others. I think, Natasha, you retweeted that it's the most sensitive sort of information the U.S. has, as you know from your perch at the Pentagon. So it's just a vivid reminder of the concrete dangers of a Trump presidency. How are the countries of the world tacking to the possibility of his returning as president, or have they already altered their relations to the U.S. based on the damage he's done? So I think it's fair to say the world is watching, right? The world has been watching for a long time now. They certainly watched when Mr. Trump first won election. They've been watching every year since. It's one of the reasons I think everyone pays such close attention to the Biden foreign policy, in particular when it comes to the war in Ukraine, because every little decision and every little leverage point means something. But I have to tell you, the more senior diplomats you talk to, whether they are from allied nations or from nations with which we have maybe more of a frenemy kind of relationship, I'm talking about India, Turkey, and so on, they are preparing for a potential 
return of the Trump presidency and what that might mean. And writ large, that means a total reversal of the Biden foreign policy today. And that's chaotic for them. It's uncertain for them. It's worrying for them. But it's not as if it's something they have ruled out. It is very much a real possibility in them because they are watching domestic politics as closely in the U.S. as as anyone else. So that's sort of the big picture thing. They see the polls, right? Yeah. Are they actually changing their practices as of today? You know, whatever Biden is privy to, Trump could be privy to in a year. Who knows what he does with them? Is it just plans in place or actual sort of arm's length as of 2023 because of this frightening possibility? Well, I think it's hard to say at this moment. I think there was a lot of reporting under the Trump administration that these allies were taking steps to limit their intelligence sharing with the U.S. because of the possibility that Trump would blab secrets, right? And we actually saw him disclose early on in in his presidency classified information to the Russians. So it's obviously something that they have all dealt with over the course of his presidency. And now the big question, of course, the big foreign policy challenge is going to be Ukraine. And if you'll recall, Trump was asked by CNN directly during that town hall, you know, who do you want to win the war, Russia or Ukraine? And he would not answer. And now his big thing is that he just has to get Zelensky and Putin in a room together and he can work it out in 24 hours. He can work out some kind of deal. But the Ukrainians, of course, are looking at that and saying, well, any kind of negotiation that Trump thinks he can do is probably just going to be something that's going to kind of sell us out, right? And so all of this is kind of swirling in the background ahead of some really crucial months in the next year of the Ukrainian war, because, of course, the U.S. funding is in limbo. For NATO and allies, it's totally unclear whether they're going to be able to maintain their support for the war. And then you have the election next year, and it's unclear whether the U.S. position formally will even be to support the Ukrainians. So I think that there's a lot of uncertainty, to say the least. And our allies, particularly the Brits, who have been so forward leaning when it comes to Ukraine and when it comes to other foreign policy issues, I think that they're probably going to have to figure out how to grapple with the possibility that Trump is going to come back. I would uh, build on what Natasha just said there. So many of my conversations with diplomats based in Washington, administration officials working for President Biden, is that they're not so much grappling with the possibility of a Trump return in terms of how it could affect their intelligence gathering and whether secrets are secure if this this man becomes president again. It's really about the broader themes that are out there of nationalism and populism that are coursing through the Republican Party in this country. And there's an acceptance that this is not going away in the United States, in part because there seems to be an acceptance that it's not going to wither away in their own respective countries as well. There is this overflow of kind of nationalistic sentiments everywhere and this anger that and frustration. You see it on social media all the time in these confrontations with leaders that are beyond the United States, like with Justin Trudeau and people coming up to him angry about whether it's his taxation policies or vaccine policies or that whole realm of issues that have spurred controversy since the pandemic. So I think there's a bit more preparedness among global leaders and global diplomats this time around. This isn't a 2017 type moment where there was a bit of shock and stunned reaction to Trump's election. Uh, They've been through Trump. They know what that means. And what they're really trying to gauge based on what I can share on private reporting conversations is whether the United States is more prone to kind of a celebrity populist leader or whether it's actually tracking further to the right and becoming more of a Matt Gates, Steve Bannon, hard right nationalistic enterprise, politically speaking. It's interesting because I'm sure, Bob, as you know, like there are so many conversations behind the scenes about how Republicans, for example, are approaching the Ukraine situation, approaching other kinds of support for other countries and, you know, like Taiwan, for example, where they say one thing publicly and then privately they say, actually, no, we do support Ukraine funding. And so it's hard to gauge where people actually are. I know Jim Jordan came out, said recently that he would not support funding Ukraine, that that's not what America's priority is right now. Some other members of Congress came out and said, well, that's not what he's telling us behind closed doors. And so I think that there's probably, if there's confusion here in the US amongst us, there's probably a lot of confusion also abroad. Yeah, I used to think it was the case. I think we did generally, there was a foreign policy establishment and whatever the sort of pontifications or weird stances politicians would take 
things would be steady in the real at the real level. But Trump has eroded that idea. He's perfectly ready to be a bull in a China shop or in, in foreign policy. I think, Robert, you made a really important point that I want to make sure I understand. So the this that they assume will continue and they're planning for is Trumpism, not Trump. In other words, it's less of the focus that we have monomaniacally on will he be convicted, will he exit the stage. It could be Trump and another guy's. It's really the more global movements that we have to adjust for, so less focused on this one guy. There was a sense among my sources in the foreign policy national security space that when Trump was elected, he shattered what they considered as kind of a refrain, a shorthand, the rules-based international order, where there were certain rules, not a rule of law necessarily, but a collective set of institutions and understandings about how policy would be made on a global level, different summits, different alliances that had been entrenched over time. There was an acceptance that American presidents understood the rules-based international order that had been built over time slowly and with different parts. Trump comes in, and in their view, shatters all of that, but doesn't really have an ideological project he's mounting. There are spurts of kind of nationalism, spurts of maybe getting out of NATO, getting out of other international agreements. But Trump, more than anything, is just about fighting what he believes is the status quo or something he thinks is a, quote, bad deal with a very transactional real estate mentality. And so that eroded that an American president would always follow the rules-based international order, especially since World War II, with not only an acceptance, but a, an embrace of international institutions that had been built after World War II. Now there's a question about, it's not just Trumpism, it's is the United States going to become a place where democracy doesn't function? I mean, there, there's a lot of questions about different countries around the world now always about whether democracy functions. We've seen the recent flurry of questions about Israel and the judicial policies there. After January 6th, that was really a wake-up call for whether, if let's say Trump comes back, are they going to be dealing with a country that has disruptive democracy or just disruptive policy? I think the other part of that, if I can just add on, it also calls into question this idea of the default being, especially with our European allies, that the U.S. would take the lead when it comes to these kinds of transnational issues that countries have to collaborate on. The war in Ukraine is, of course, the perfect example right now. But when you look at other places that they know they have to collaborate on working forward, on containing China, for example, and continuing to counter Russia, on climate change, on all those kinds of things, there's increasing chatter among the European allies in particular about if they had to go it alone, basically, without the U.S., who would take the lead? And you increasingly see someone like Macron emerging there. It used to be Merkel in, in Germany, of course. That's no longer the case with Olaf Scholz. And so I think just the fact that those conversations are going on speaks to the level of doubt and the questions that they have when looking at America and, and America's democracy and stability right now. And a related thing you read, at least, is that just what's happened again in 2023, but as a result of the past eight years, the flirtation with autocracy at home has eroded the U.S.'s moral authority to stand up to dictators and despots around the world. Do you think that our sort of moral authority has been eroded by the last eight years? Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. And I mean, just look at the way the U.S. relationship with India has sort of evolved over the last few years in particular. Like India is called the largest democracy in the world, right? But even there, there's a lot of questions about the growing Hindu nationalist sentiment and the cracking down on journalism and free speech and civil society and persecution and violence against the minority Muslim population. And yet you will not see the Biden administration stand up and overtly say, stop this, we don't approve, we condemn this behavior. And that is because they really need India for a number of other foreign policy concerns, and chief among them trying to counter Russia's growing influence in India. You see Russia now pushing to get India to join the UN Permanent Security Council. There's a lot of sort of realigning of these traditional geopolitical alliances, and we're undergoing kind of a massive global shift, unlike anything we've seen in modern history. And the US is aware of all of that maybe doesn't have the same uh, force to go forward. What about this aspect of Trump? So 
he blabs. He's got a transactional uh, point of view. He's a bull in a china shop. He's unsophisticated. He's also, at least domestically, is very nativist and xenophobic, uh, very anti-immigration. What's the impact of that kind of nativist impulse that Trump embodies on foreign relations? Definitely on Mexico. I mean, you already see that kind of strain continuing with the Mexican president criticizing Republicans for what he believes is their influence on the Biden administration to continue some of the border policies that the Trump administration uh, was was looking at. And, and he ha- has seen that as kind of a betrayal, I think, by the U.S. But look, I mean, I think when it comes to that, that's going to be a pretty consistent theme that we see, right, from Donald Trump if he gets reelected. I mean, this is this has become such a key issue for the Republicans that it's now being tied, of course, to the Ukraine funding issue. I mean, the Biden administration is having to figure out how to link these two in order to get something that they believe is a moral imperative, which is to continue funding uh, the Ukrainians in their fight against Russia. And so it's all becoming kind of connected and interlinked. And and that, I think, is kind of a remnant from the Trump administration. It seems as if Russia and China have increasing presence around the world in places like, you've written about this, uh, Natasha, sub-Saharan Africa, but they're offering an alternative kind of anti-democratic model for development, not the not the shining city on the hill. And, and so it strikes me, it, it, this is my question to you experts, that the power struggle for third world influence is still very much alive post-Cold War. What difficulties is the Trump legacy causing us there? I know that the Biden administration is trying to reverse the legacy of neglect that the Trump administration left when it comes to Africa. That is one of their top priorities now is kind of making the U.S. presence more known on the continent, especially as China continues to invest there. And as Wagner Group, which is the Russian mercenary organization, you know, is is still there, still has a pretty hefty presence there. And so I traveled with Secretary of Defense Austin there last week, and that was a kind of a main theme for him was that the United States needs these partnerships with these African countries to stay away from the authoritarian ones because they will come to regret it. And basically that the U.S. is the better deal for these countries. And I think, you know, we all know that Trump called these countries shithole countries when he was president. And so now the administration is trying to reverse the momentum that Russia and China gained on the continent and really trying to make it a priority. But obviously that doesn't really break through uh, that much for the American public, but it is something that behind the scenes uh, they're very keen on. Yeah, it just seems this recurring problem of you you, you talk a good game now, but you know, why would would things be any different in a couple years? Robert, I wanted to ask you more of a domestic political question about all of this, which is Russia has such a sweetheart relationship with Trump. They're even meddling in, they're offering their opinions about the indictments and the like. Why isn't Russia's endorsement more of a scarlet letter for Trump? You would think given traditional American attitudes about Russia, that would be something unwelcome, but it seems either people are unaware of it or they just shrug it off. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me from a reporting standpoint because the idea of Russia and whether it's a threat or not under Putin has been muddied up in Republican politics over the past two decades. I mean, when I started out as a reporter in my early 20s, I was still hearing about President George W. Bush looking Putin in the eye, seeing his soul. There was a a sense of engagement with Russia, even as Russia really frustrated the United States and angered the United States with its handling of Georgia and other issues. It kind of fell on the back burner of foreign policy priorities. And as the Cold War seemed further and further away, Republican voters didn't have the same fixation on Russia as a threat and something that kind of galvanized their view of the world When Mitt Romney focused on Russia in 2012 in that famous debate exchange with President Obama, it was almost mocked when he talked about Russia as a serious threat by both some Democrats and some Republicans. And now, about a decade later, in the wake of the Russia investigation that was viewed by so many Republican voters, especially rank and file Trump voters, as a politicized investigation, and they have a steep skepticism about anyone, whether it's in the news media the foreign policy establishment, the intelligence community, articulating new themes or warnings on 
the threat of Russia. And I think that's part of the reason the war in Ukraine, and I applaud Natasha and her colleagues for their coverage of that, and the Emmy Award they won, is uh, it doesn't sink in to the Republican electorate, at least, in the same way that it did many years ago. And that's, I think, a persistent challenge for why there's such an aversion to funding for Ukraine and why when people talk about Trump getting endorsements from Russian-based media outlets, it almost seems like a drop in the water in terms of affecting the Republican voter. The other part of that is, you know, you mentioned kind of the Republican establishment. For the Republicans, even in the House, who've been working on foreign policy and national security issues for years, there basically is consensus among Republicans and Democrats on what the best foreign policy approach is on all of this, especially when it comes to Ukraine. And they're probably in the majority when it comes to even the House Republican conference right now. But the loudest, most vocal minority of those House Republicans, as we've seen with a number of of issues now, have kind of dominated the conversation and calling into question a lot of that funding, even though it's something polls show again and again that most Americans continue to support. But it is still such a challenge for this administration to draw that line, to say you need to worry about that, you need to worry about threats to democracy, and here's why, specifically because of that really good timeline that Bob laid out, and we've just moved further away from it, and it's not real for Americans in the way it used to be. And I think that's exactly why Biden is going to give a major speech on this, right? I mean, he has seen, I mean, even some Republicans in Congress say, look, you're not making the case for why we need to continue doing this. You're not explaining to the American people what the end game is, what the overall strategy is, how long we're going to be doing this, and why it's important for the U.S. to support something that seems a world away, right? And so that's been a consistent message to the White House. It seems like they're finally taking that to heart. but. What is it going to achieve? That remains to be seen, obviously. So this brings us into the whole broader part of the Republican phenomenon and Trumpism. Jim Jordan actually could become Speaker of the House. So uh, you have the concrete possibility, in other words, that an important voice in the Republican Party, if you would tally it up by numbers, you would think that Ukraine aid remains secure. But it isn't just numbers. So let me serve that up. How at risk do you think it is that steadfast support for Ukraine a year from now, it's you know substantially uh, less? And is this a true scary prospect here that we are or, or just a lot of you know domestic political talk? I, I would just quickly say um, we've discussed Trump a lot, and I agree with Amna. You know, you look at Senator McConnell in the Senate, and Jonathan Martin at Politico wrote a really deep dive piece about how McConnell's whole perspective on his legacy on foreign policy right now is to support Ukraine in addition to his efforts to overhaul the judiciary in the past few decades. But one thing I'm watching in the coming year, regardless of who wins in 2024, is where does the American left go on this issue? Because we've seen Robert F. Kennedy Jr., for example, so far not get much traction in the Democratic race and is expected to maybe run as an independent. But there is a an element on the left that has an aversion to the war in Ukraine as well and U.S. support. I think back to October 2022, you you might recall that Representative uh, Pramila Jayapal, who runs the Congressional Progressive Caucus, issued a letter pushing President Biden to pursue diplomacy, pursue a peace deal as soon as possible in Ukraine and and to try to get Russia and Ukraine to the table. She had to pull that back under pressure because Democrats, of course, were broadly supporting President Biden's position on how to approach the war. But I think that episode is an example that while there's a lot of support for President Biden's position on Ukraine in the Democratic Party, it's it's definitely not a monolith. And that kind of Bernie Sanders progressive wing of the Democratic Party is never really comfortable with this kind of engagement in war, even if the U.S. is not directly involved. And so you look at Matt Gates in the House such a hardliner on the right, but he often tries to find common cause with Ro Khanna, the progressive congressman from California, different members of the progressive caucus that he feels like the left and the right could combine. And I just, I'm watching whether that ever happens on Ukraine as kind of a fatigue sets in in some quarters. I take what Robert's saying to mean that forget just Jim Jordan, broadly speaking, there are the pieces on the board that might add up to some kind of erosion of overall support for Ukraine. Do you guys share that assessment? 
I feel like there's two side streams to that. And it's absolutely true. One is just, God, for the last generation, we have seen a growing isolationism within the American public because an entire generation grew up with the backdrop of a war that was thousands of miles away that we've been engaged in for years. And they had no idea why we were there in the first place. And that is just, A, that's one thing kind of underscoring a lot of American society and younger Americans in particular. And the other part of it is that none of this can be separated from our domestic electoral politics. And we are in a gearing up for another election cycle. And all of this is tied up in this. I mean, the fact that Ukraine funding is now basically completely tied up in the speaker's race, and we really have no idea what's going to happen there, I think speaks to just how precarious it is. And you do have a number of House Republicans who even came out before and said, you know, it's like a $300 million aid package. I think they separated out of defense funding. Natasha will know better than I do on this. But they already said they were opposed to that because what they want to message is that we are focused on the issues that matter to the American public. We're focused on the economy. We're focused on crime. We're focused on immigration. This is not a priority for us. And that, too, speaks to the divide of what we're seeing publicly in terms of what they say are their priorities, but privately what they say they will support. It still has to come out publicly in a way that they can back it up to their constituencies. And that is where the real issue is. Is that the reason, by the way? I mean, why is this such a big deal for the Jim Jordans and Matt Gaetzes? It feels like they've really zeroed in on Ukraine, which had been such a strong national consensus. How does it fit into an overall kind of MAGA platform? I think a lot of it has to do with the history that President Biden and his son have with the Ukrainians. Remember, that's become a whole huge talking point and kind of scandal on the right when it comes to Hunter Biden's, for example, ties to Ukrainian energy and President Biden's talks with the former Ukrainian prime minister about certain corruption issues. And so a lot of this There's a feeling in certain fringes on the right, which is becoming, I think, more mainstream, that this is all just one big money making scheme for the Ukrainians, that Zelensky is corrupt, and that President Biden and his son are in on it. I think that's definitely kind of seeping into the the consciousness of why some of the Republicans anyway are kind of against it. And there's also a narrative, of course, more broadly about Ukrainian corruption. The administration has acknowledged that there is a huge corruption problem in the Ukrainian government. And so that makes, I think, a lot of Americans skeptical about where all of this taxpayer money is going. It is a lot of money. It is billions and billions of dollars. It is not a huge percentage, of course, of the Pentagon's budget, but it is substantial. And so I think that combined with the fact that Ukraine hasn't really articulated an end game, right? A strategy for success. The Biden administration hasn't either. NATO hasn't either. What does victory actually look like? I think all of that is kind of contributing to the hazard of fear. And is it having a current impact? Alexander Vindman actually said that the recent brutal Russian attack had a, quote, clear connection to the House GOP's cutting aid to Ukraine, and, you know, implicitly asserting Russia's looking. Do you buy that connection? I think we know Russia's watching, right? President Putin saved some of his most brutal attacks on Kyiv for when Zelensky was visiting the United States. Like there's, there is a clear connection there. I don't know if I'd go so far as to back up what Colonel Vindman has been saying about these particular attacks, but it, it's absolutely clear that Russia is watching and that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not going as they had planned or as the Americans had hoped it would go. We've canvassed for half our time or more the effects of Trumpism and even the broader. I was surprised to learn that the GOP kerfuffle was front page news around the world. So obviously there's a lot of focus. Let's just broaden now to foreign policy, trying best we can to filter Trump out of it. Let's start here. Heather Cox Richardson, very well-known historian, argues that the Biden administration's reworking of global relationships is the biggest story in at least a generation in foreign affairs, probably more. I venture to say that by far the majority of the electorate wouldn't even know what the hell she's talking about. Do you agree with the assessment? Some huge stuff has been happening in the last few years in foreign affairs with huge implications going forward. I think the Biden presidency is something that Because of him following Trump on foreign policy, he's been building this kind of new Biden doctrine in in terms of engagement. 
that has gotten attention, but might get more attention down the line from historians, because Biden has such a history in foreign affairs going back to his time on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He comes to this with a real worldview and his spending at the beginning of 2021, 2022 got enormous attention, trillions of dollars for infrastructure for the American Rescue Plan. But at the same time, I mean, it goes back to what we've been discussing. There's been this undercurrent of Biden on Ukraine, trying to keep up the United States engagement there, trying to figure out Zelensky, always dealing with the hovering threat of a nuclear issue or crisis, should Putin ever move in that direction, trying to confront China, but also contain China, dealing with India and Europe in the American continents in new ways. I just did a piece on Franklin Ford's book for CBS Saturday Morning. And it's interesting because that book's so much, a lot lot on foreign policy, but it just, some of it doesn't rise to the level of generating enormous buzz for whatever reason. But it is really interesting because Biden has this tight relationship with Secretary of State Blinken, with Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. And there's really been this kind of effort with that trio and others, of course, involved to get Biden's perspective, point of view, and view of engagement out there. Do you guys discern a Biden doctrine? Robert mentioned that term. Is it premature to say that? Broadly speaking, it's always been about returning to American leadership on the global stage. It's always been about returning to those global norms, about adhering to the same sort of international bodies and rules-based order that have guided the last two generations on this planet. And the problem is that like all forces are working against him on this front right now. Even if you look at one small microcosm of it, right? He talks about uh, on immigration, for example, they've always wanted to have a safe, humane border policy. And what you've actually seen because of forces like instability and insecurity and climate change fueling more migration than we've ever seen before in modern history, you've actually seen this administration have to adhere to a lot of the same policies that the previous one put into place simply because they have run out of other options. And so while there is this rhetoric about what the world should be and what America's place should be in the world, I I do think it's becoming increasingly difficult for the administration to adhere to that simply because the global forces are all working against him right now. One thinks of Biden, there's, I think, a strain of criticism of he's just old school in the extreme. So his instincts in re-engagement involve a lot of well-established institutions like the G20 and the United Nations. Do you think that those institutions are themselves no longer the leaders in the world? Or where do they stand in terms of their influence in the world and you know ability to actually make things happen? That's definitely a valid criticism, right? I mean, some of these institutions, their relevancy is certainly in question. But I think that for Biden and for his advisors, the overarching theme and guiding principle is always that engagement is always better and that the more of these kind of international bodies there are that bring kind of these large economies and large democracies together, the better. Now, of course, some of those bodies still have Russia in it. And, you know, the Biden administration has said that they want to continue engaging with Russia, you know, and that, and not only Russia, but they want to engage with North Korea and they want to engage with the Chinese. I mean, they are making a lot of efforts, it seems, behind the scenes to engage with, with these countries, whether it's with regard to, for example, um, hostage uh, release and prisoner swaps, or when it's with regard to the economy. I think the overarching principle here is that they just want communication and openness and not for America to kind of isolate itself the way that Donald Trump did threatening to even pull out of NATO, right? So yes, some of these institutions are archaic, but on the other hand, I think their their policy is like communication is the key. Um, now you sat down with the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. earlier this week. What were your takeaways on this point of the U.N.'s centrality to foreign policy aims? It's Interesting. I was actually just reflecting on what I think Natasha nailed so perfectly about the efficacy of a lot of these bodies. 
And I think that decline in trust uh, is the same we've seen across a number of institutions of power, right? That how well do these bodies really serve us? Look at all the many places in which they've failed. I was talking specifically to Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield about the U.S. proposal that then was adopted for now a Kenyan-led force to intervene on the ground in Haiti. And if you just look at what's happened in Haiti for the last several years now, since the assassination of President Jovenel Moïse, it has basically been a trend towards chaos. And it's fueling thousands of people leaving and an economy completely stalled and people basically afraid every day that because gangs are in control of most of the capital city for sure and other parts as well. And it took over a year for the body to act, to put together a force which will not be deployed for at least a few more months, and who knows the impact it will have on the ground. And so I think as an outside observer, if you're watching this all unfold, there's a valid question of, well, why did it take so long and what is it really going to do? But then I also think more broadly about what we just watched unfold on the UNGA stage, on the General Assembly stage. And there's a lot of focus paid to President Biden's speech and the calls for protecting democracy around the world and countering rising authoritarianism and fighting global climate change together. But there were a number of key leaders who weren't even there this year, right? I mean, the UK's Rishi Sunak wasn't there. French President Emmanuel Macron wasn't there. Uh, neither leader from China or Russia was there. And a number of issues sort of are central to having their involvement and, and it would be key to make any movement on. And so we're definitely in a time of sort of calling into question the potency of a lot of these institutions. But to go back to what Natasha said, the Biden administration's approach on all of this is these are the bodies we have. You have to work within the institutions we have. And the only way to make them work is to continue to participate and invest in them. It's now time to take a moment for our sidebar feature, which explains some of the issues and relationships that are prominent in the news. Today's sidebar is about campaign finance laws and how Congress has attempted over time to counter the influence of money in politics. And to explain this concept, I'm thrilled to welcome Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill is an actor, voice artist, and writer. He is most widely known for his role as Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars franchise beginning with the original 1977 film and subsequently winning three Saturn Awards for his performances in The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and The Last Jedi. Mark is also a prolific voice actor in animation and video games, perhaps most well known for his role as the Joker in various DC Comics projects, commencing with Batman, the animated series in 1992. I give you Mark Hamill on campaign finance laws. Although the Supreme Court has struck down many basic efforts to regulate campaign contributions and financing, there remain multiple limitations in the general area. The Federal Elections Commission, FEC, an independent regulatory agency that serves, quote, to disclose campaign finance information, to enforce the provisions of the law, such as the limits and prohibitions on contributions, and to oversee the public funding of presidential elections, unquote, oversees most of them. The FEC's functions are critical in ensuring the legitimacy, transparency, and security of federal elections. Campaign finance law becomes increasingly important as spending in federal elections continues to increase from year to year. The first federal campaign finance laws were introduced in 1907 by the Tillman Act, which blocked corporation and banks from giving money to federal campaigns. Since then, several reforms and changes have been made to the structures and rules of federal campaign finance. In 1974, the FEC was created to enforce the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971. These requirements included disclosing of campaign expenditures and limits on contributions by individuals to campaigns. Currently, an individual may only give $3,300 to a candidate per election and only $5,000 to political action committees, PACs, per year. PACs are organizations that pool funds for political expenditures, including campaigning for or against candidates or laws. 
A major change to federal campaign finance occurred with the Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United versus FEC, 2010. The majority opinion struck down prohibitions against independent expenditures on campaigns by corporations. Independent expenditures are considered money spent on elections in favor or against candidates or laws that are not in coordination with said political campaign. This developed the groundwork for super PACs, organizations which may raise and spend unlimited funds in support of a political cause or campaign so long as it remains independent of said campaign. Critics contend that as a result of these changes, the FEC and federal campaign finance law are ineffective in limiting the influence of money in politics. For Talking Feds, I'm Mark Hamill. Thank you so much, Mark Hamill. Last year, Mark became an ambassador of the United24 fundraising platform, which raises funds to support Ukraine in the war of Russian aggression. To find out more how you can support Ukraine, you can head over to u24.gov.ua. And now, a word from our sponsor. The American Civil Liberties Union. Hi, I'm Maribel Hernandez Rivera, a Deputy National Political Director at the ACLU. The promise of America is to serve as a beacon of hope and freedom for people fleeing persecution, violence, war, and human rights violations around the world. Yet, the Biden administration has chosen to replicate harmful and illegal Trump-era policies that ban people from seeking asylum at the southern border, betraying the ideals that represent the best of our country. Biden's asylum ban is causing needless suffering and placing people at grave risk. The ACLU successfully sued the Trump administration when it implemented asylum bans. And now we're suing the Biden administration over their own ban. For more on how the ACLU is fighting for the rights of asylum seekers, go to aclu.org. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's Spirited Debate, we hop into the beer cooler to ask the question, to IPA or not IPA? The India Pale Ale has become synonymous with the word hoppy. And it's that hoppiness that's created a bittersweet relationship with IPAs that has divided beer lovers across the world into two categories. Those who love this style of the pale ale for its full-flavored bite with flavors of lemon and pine needle, plus typically higher alcohol content. And then those who prefer a little less sharpness with each sip. So what gives IPAs that signature bite? Well, there's another abbreviation you should know, IBU which stands for International Bitterness Units. The higher the IBU, the more bitter the beer. Luckily, at Total Wine & More, we carry an array of IPAs that offer up a huge range of happiness. We've all been bitten by a hoppy IPA in our past. Swing by your local Total Wine & More and let our guides find you an IPA that's more Y-O-U. So find what you love and love what you find. Only at Total Wine & More. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. We're careening madly, I know, from topic to topic, but only every, you know, six months or so do we get the chance to have folks like you around. And I want to um, spend a little bit of time on China and a little bit of time on India. So, Natasha, you've already mentioned that Biden may be uh, meeting with the Chinese president next month. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo had a pretty high visibility visit there. China's economy has been slowing down remarkably. Where are we on this dance of keeping them at bay, but trying to be constructive and Biden's efforts in particular to be more engaged with China, which I think most people in the administration consider the uh, most formidable adversary? 
I've been tr- tracking China in the 2024 presidential campaign, and it's so evident that Republicans right now, like Ron DeSantis, when you cover him on the campaign trail, he talks about U.S.-China relations as approaching a kind of new Cold War. And he really is framing it in that way. And it's because so many Republicans now are competing with Trump, who's only begun to escalate his rhetoric against China, calling for total like economic independence, more tariffs, countering China on perceived economic espionage efforts. And so you you see in all of these Republicans, like in Nikki Haley, too, that they want to broaden the war with China, the soft war, the Cold War, the global power standoff beyond just an economic front and make it much more kind of based on a military confrontation or intelligence confrontation. And it's creating a huge sense of competition among ambitious Republicans, like in terms of how how many come out to ban TikTok or or to ban Chinese-based companies from buying land in the United States. These things are kind of expanding how China is being confronted by Republicans. And it all comes as President Biden is you know, at times what seems to be at a standstill with China, there's a lack of communication. What do you mean exactly the standstill? Well, there's been a publicly reported uh, decline in communications between Chinese leaders and American leaders. There's been, you know, different visits to different summits where they've had some some one-on-one meetings. But you, you see she at times seeming to ignore some global summits, not necessarily rushing to sit down with President Biden. And the back channels uh, among military leaders it has eroded based on reporting from numerous news outlets. So you're, you're seeing it's not at a standstill in terms of it being placid, but there's definitely a chilliness that's evident. Yeah. And just from my kind of perch here at the Pentagon, I mean, just going off of what Bob said, like there is a lot of concern about the fact that the Chinese have not reestablished the lines of communication between defense officials, because, I mean, Secretary Austin has not spoken to his Chinese counterpart in over a year, not to mention the fact that China has changed its leadership and its defense ministry quite a few times, but still those lines of communication have not been reopened. And there is a lot that could go wrong, right? I mean, the U.S. is operating pretty close to the Chinese on a regular basis in the South China Sea and elsewhere. And there's also the huge risk, of course, that China could make a move on Taiwan. I mean, that is what people at the Pentagon, the military officials are thinking about as one of the biggest kind of pacing challenges when it comes to U.S. foreign policy is is kind of how, how to predict what Xi Jinping is willing to do when it comes to Taiwan. Is he going to make a move soon because he sees that the U.S. is distracted by Ukraine and they are kind of at their peak of power and they're kind of declining. We see their economy declining a lot. So is now the best time or is it best to wait and kind of have the element of surprise? So they're kind of all, they're always gaming this out and, and the risk of escalation is so acute and so precarious right now, just because they have refused to reopen those lines. It's definitely a big issue. And back to the Republican political climate, it's a little strange because presumably the prospect of their moving on Taiwan would, you know, have everyone up in arms. And yet one of the main arguments for our needing to stay the course in Ukraine is to not embolden China. So it seems connected in a way that escapes Republican sort of focus. All right. So (laughs) let's go to a little bit to India, which I think seems to be emerging on sort of both sides, both in terms of economic engagement, but also potential risks. So, you know, today our cooperation spans more and more global health and technology, et cetera. But there's this worry about India's democratic backsliding under Modi and their failure to condemn the the invasion of Ukraine. How would you assess the state of U.S.-India relations today? And where does it figure in the overall Biden administration priority? I think there's sort of a a sense among Indian leadership that the U.S. needs them more than India necessarily needs the U.S. right now. And you've seen that both in the way that India has maintained a, a policy of neutrality when it comes to the war in Ukraine, They've not condemned Russia's actions. I I know they did earlier. I believe they still are purchasing discounted oil through Russia. 
and in some way fueling the war. And of course, you mentioned the democratic backsliding we've seen under the leadership of Narendra Modi as well. At the same time, there's huge economic cooperation. I think the U.S. and India just signed like a multi-billion dollar jet deal as well. So there's every reason, right, for the two largest superpowers in the world right now to be trying to make friends with India. And India has maintained this position where they know they're sitting in a place where they can afford to play both sides. They have strong economic and have long had strong economic cooperation with China. They continue to build those ties with the U.S. And it's really not in Modi's interest to have to turn one way or the other completely right now. And he also has huge domestic support. So that's no longer an issue for him at home. Let me just try a sort of umbrella closeout question about the, everything we've been talking about. And, you know, factoring in the effects of Trump and Trumpism and our own political turmoil. But where does the U.S. stand as a global power? And in particular, can and should the U.S. still occupy, let me put it that way, the preeminent role on the world stage? I think in the absence of any other nation stepping in to fill the void, it is still clearly the U.S. I mean, there's still the default of turning to the U.S. to see what they will do and how they will lead, even as other nations make plans for a future in which that's not the case. And look, credit where credit is due. When Russia launched its unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine, it was the U.S. It was the President Biden who stepped up to rally the NATO allies to come together in a way that they haven't in a generation. And that is certainly worth noting. That is a historic milestone that will go down in the history books as that alliance coming together to counter aggression at that moment. That said, you know, when you talk to other national security leaders, Natasha referenced this earlier about one of the Biden administration's chief concerns being the global south, in particular, how long we've ignored investing in places like the entire continent of Africa. The CIA director, Bill Burns, was asked recently about what worries him that we don't talk enough about. And he just said, Africa, we don't spend enough time talking about these nations. And we've now seen a kind of coup belt emerging of a number of places where militaries have overturned their elected governments and they are aligning themselves with Russia. And this isn't the kind of thing that happens overnight, right? It is a slow chipping away of some of those democratic norms as, as established values in a number of these nations. And that's quite literally how the world changes. And that's happening country by country. And so, yes, for now, I think it's absolutely still the U.S. as both the moral and international leader when it comes to a lot of these issues that we have to tackle together in a world that's growing increasingly interconnected and increasingly smaller. But there's a lot of questions about what that future looks like in the very near future. I think everything you said was spot on. It's just hard to say at this moment. I think that Biden is kind of holding the the train back, right? Like his whole kind of argument was when he was running was like a return to normalcy, a return to America's place in the world. But as Amna has pointed out many times, the rest of the world is kind of going against that. It's like the alliance and the core alliances, the European alliance, for example, that are kind of trying to hold this all together. And they have tried to show their support for Ukraine as being kind of the pinnacle of that and how and an example of how this is still very much alive. But if Biden is out of office next year, how fast is that going to change? I just don't think we know, but I think it could change very quickly. We're in a very fluid moment in terms of American politics, and that means we're in a fluid moment, likely in terms of what America means in the world. We have a traditional Democratic president in President Joe Biden, relatively speaking, who is facing challenges at home politically, not in terms of maybe losing the nomination, but in terms of the economy at times, having fits and starts. Uh, people in his party, and especially among Republicans, questioning his age, and he is expected to be the Democratic nominee, and he could win a second term. At the same time, with the rise of Trump and looming trials, he, he at once could be the Republican nominee and the next president to have another term, or it could all fall apart. And there's a lot of sense of uncertainty when I'm talking to people at the highest ranks of not just the diplomatic community and in intelligence and national security space, but of the political space. And because of all this uncertainty, which really seems almost unusual in both parties at once, what America's role in the world is going to be is, is really, I think, to be determined. And a lot could hinge on what are external factors. We think about, I think about covering the 2020 campaign 
in February and March of 2020, I was with Bernie Sanders in Burlington, Vermont. And then what happens? The global pandemic, something no one predicts. It becomes the, the issue of the time. So is it a China incursion into Taiwan? Is it nuclear weapons being used in Ukraine or some kind of total change in the war there that leads everyone to sit up and it becomes the, the something that's at the forefront of American politics? We can't predict what's going to happen, but I've seen campaigns upended before by global events, and we could very well see that again. Really useful, I think, to bring it home to the domestic uh, political situation and a bullseye, at least, to what I was hoping to anchor this discussion in. All right, we're out of time, save for one minute for our final five words or fewer question. And keeping with the theme overall, so many uh, nations have real stereotypes about America and Americans, which still kind of dominate cultural consciousness around the world. Which stereotype about Americans do you think holds water and is more or less true? Five words or fewer. I'll go first. Five words. Hard rock cafe popularity true. (laughs) I think I would say that Americans can be loud. (laughs) And and, uh, I think most places I've been, if you're in a public space, it's not hard to find the Americans. I think I'll phone it in, lest I get in trouble with CNN. (laughs) I may get in trouble for this, but eh, I think it's true. Don't care about foreign policy. (laughs) And with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much to Natasha, Amna, and Robert. And thank you listeners for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a minute to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we're posting full episodes, talking books, and other bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for our supporters. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether they're for Talking 5 or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Mal Meliez, associate produced by Catherine Devine, sound engineering by Matt McArdle, Our research producer is Zeke Reed. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Meredith McCabe, Akshaj Turbailu, and Emma Maynard. And our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Fez is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.